Hello everybody, my name is Artem Kriavka and this is Startup Garage Show. As you can see, we are right now in the, in the garage and everything is beginning from the garage. So today I'm very excited to announce our first guest, Kyle Orcher, and his startup. He will tell about his startup by himself. Uh, for now, I just can say that uh, I've met Kyle not so long time ago, but we already uh, had a very interesting conversation about different things, about hardware, about software, about knowledge management, about artificial intelligence. And that's how we came to this moment and we finally can discuss it even deeper, uh, those things that Kyle is interested in and working on. And yeah, it's. I hope it will be exciting, exciting um, conversation about drones and how artificial intelligence can revolutionize defense with uh, knowledge management. So yeah, Kyle, tell a few words about yourself. Yeah, Arson, thank you so much for having me. And yeah, I guess I'm the first in-person guest on the Startup Garage show. So thanks again for making it happen. We have excellent equipment and yeah, so my name's Kyle. I am an early stage startup founder located in San Mateo. And what we do is we're building GPS denied drones for creating BIM models out of buildings that already exist or are under construction. So essentially drones that can do scam to BIM. So, and you know, it's not an easy undertaking, but uh, we are working steadfastly towards that goal. And yeah, I'm happy here to, to talk about defense and how computer vision, knowledge management, knowledge management, and drones play a part in, in you know defense and other areas. It's it's great, Kyle. Uh, you know, before we will go to some deeper level, uh, yeah, I know that you are a student of Steve Blank. I, I really respect this um, this man. Because uh, what he's doing is, uh, is, for me, is one of the best approaches in entrepreneurship. And now you also are start your journey as entrepreneur. So, what can you tell maybe about your experience? On what stage are you right now? And what what do you plan to do next? Somehow our community can you know help you as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Um to give context why you know why I'm even giving you a two cents on on defense is because my company started out of hacking for defense at Stanford so my last last quarter at Stanford when I was an undergrad I took a class with Steven Weinstein Steve Blank and Joe Felter and these are all guys that are um, aligned with the Hoover Institution and the Hoover Institution recognizes the need for driving innovation in the private sector um, for the dual use case paradigm, essentially, to transition hard tech and software uh, that not only can be used in commercial markets, but can also be used for our armed forces and you know, for our defense. So essentially the, the crux of what Steve Blank professes in class is you know, get outside of the building, you are ignorant, and pretending to be an expert when you're not is the easiest way to to waste a lot of resources, money, time. Uh, so essentially customer interviews and having a rapid iteration on your MVP, not spending too much money on your MVP, but having maybe a list of features, a very low fidelity prototype and showing that to as many people as possible and figuring out how much they would pay for it is, is a huge way of de-risking, you know, spending a lot of hours and cycles building something before it's actually validated uh, and the customers actually want it. So he taught us this lean launchpad methodology of going out and doing customer interviews. In 10 weeks, we did over 100 uh, with 25 different organizations. And back then, we were working with the, the US Navy and the Office of Naval Research on automating ballast tank inspection. And we, we definitely we validated the need. We talked to the key stakeholders the beneficiaries, um, and we, pre we presented a recommendation on how to improve operational readiness and the availability of warships for the U.S. Navy 
um, netting a 20, 20% increase in um, operational availability of these ships, meaning that 20% 20, 20 more available at once because of less dry docking time due to our solution. Uh, so he taught us essentially, like, you know, just to summarize all that, you don't know anything unless you get outside the building. Um, and just do those customer interviews and don't burn cycles unless there's a reason and worth of doing so. That's, that's awesome, Kyle. I, I, you know, I've read uh, several books of Steve Blank and I found it very useful and it's very wise decision, you know, to start with such methodology. And yeah, that's great that you have so, 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 so nice teachers. So I, I'm sure you will, you will do a very, very great startup. So just, yeah, keep going. And uh, yeah, that's, that's great. So why have you chosen exactly this area that I'm working right now? So what, what brings you to, to, to this moment? Yeah, yeah. So to, pro to pro provide a little more context, we started off as a computer, computer vision company. And essentially, we, we were told that hardware is hard, we should stay away. And, you know, when, when you're starting off with a startup, early days, you know, cash kind of strapped, entering into hardware is a lot of people think it's suicide. <laughs> so then we started off with a computer vision angle, you know, okay, let's abstract away the hardware, some other manufacturer that has already, you know, been producing, you know, remotely operated vehicles. Let's have them worry about that end. And then we'll worry about the analysis software um, from either the video or scanning um, that these remotely operated vehicles would do inside of the ballast tanks. And then, you know, we did some more market research um, after the class and we realized that, you know, in the drone space, um, there are computer vision platforms out there, um, annotation platforms, inspection platforms, uh, B2B solutions. Mm -hmm. And we realized that this is already kind of saturated. Um, you know, there are, there's this company called GNX that does crack detection in bridges and roads. And there are various other companies that, that provide these software ecosystems for categorically doing uh, power line inspections, cell phone tower inspections, uh, doing a photogrammetry orbit, creating a 3D model, and then being able to pin annotations on any part of that 3D model. And we realized, you know, what we were doing wasn't that different. Software uh, in this space, this um, computer vision slash annotation slash inspection space, uh, geospatial awareness, that, that was already kind of solved. Um, what really isn't solved is the GPS denied formula mm -hmm. for drones. Drones have a well-defined behavior in outdoor space because of the satellite mm -hmm. constellation uh, being able to provide, you know, re relatively one meter of accuracy um, for drones. When you get into more specialty applications like LIDAR scanning and surveying using drones, that one meter accuracy is, is not, not good enough. You, you would need something like RTK or PPK to mm -hmm. get centimeter, cent, centimeter level accuracy for those applications. But GPS denied um, flight is still an open area of research. It requires cutting edge sensors, uh, perception, and SLAM algorithms, simultaneous localization and mapping mm -hmm. techniques, uh, which is you know heavily used in robotics. Um, so pivoted away from computer vision, we were at first told that hardware is too hard. Then realized that the software that we wanted to build to help inspectors of the US Navy likely already existed. And since then, We've focused on doing things that are not readily available. And for that, uh, we've decided on just working on drones that can, that can scan buildings really well uh, with a high degree of, of accuracy, such that blue, blueprints can be recreated, such that a accurate as-is condition of buildings under construction could be done rapidly. Mm -hmm. You know, it could be done every day, could be done every week, such that a construction manager doesn't have to walk around. We, 
we looked at that solution and we were like, wow, that is something that is not readily available. All this software we were working with, thinking of making, it was already out there. So that's that's why we're where you know why we're doing this, um, and we think that has a higher risk reward trade off, mm-hmm. um, but we think ultimately the, the effort will be worth it. Yeah, it's exciting. You know, I I I, I was uh, I had some experience in this area as well uh, from my very first education, and I should say that this kind of problem is very very uh, important in even in industrial sector as well so where you can you know make very precise models or not on the buildings but also some industrial objects mm-hmm. could be very different ones so yeah I, I, I see a big opportunity f- for this technology as well and yeah that's awesome that you already started and yeah uh, I think you you will be successful yeah hopefully sure. so okay thank you for such great story and yeah now maybe we will just go to some other topics it's close to it maybe not too close but somehow related as now as you know i'm from ukraine and um, we have this whole scale war right now and drones are taken as so important dramatic role in this war modern warfare so it's used for 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 different you know purposes you know for for um, prospecting for for yeah investigation for for uh, even for for uh, war war attacks i don't know any kind so yeah drones became very important uh, in, in every in every area and of course it's becoming more advanced because i remember when first we were doing our craft drones quadrocopters and other types in hyperspace it was very amateur but it was really exciting and now there are so many advanced drones and uh, produced by different brands and yeah it seems like this uh, technology is evolving every 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 year so let's try to understand uh yeah the right yeah the rise of hard tech startup as you said it is really the most and the hardest um the hardest area i mean it's much easier to to create some software startup than hardware because hardware, yeah, probably you will tell us. So let's try, you know, to figure out where it goes and where where this movement. What what is the direction of all this movement? Yeah. yeah. So with with hard tech, the United States is is notoriously behind um, when it comes to drones. So DJI uh, was started, I think roughly a decade and a half ago, two decades ago. And it was started in a dorm room. No. Oh. Yeah. And um, yeah, I mean, I think the, the cost of labor and the cost of manufacturing in the States had a big part of, of discouraging hard tech innovation. And there's been a lot of outsourcing of, of hard tech manufacturing. And, you know, you see that with a lot of products here in this country have designed in California, manufactured in China, and yeah. I think there is some sentiment of, of bringing it all back, the manufacturing jobs, but arguably I think um, that's, a, that's a big undertaking to bring everything back because the system really relies on, on a lot of outsourcing. Um, so I think for a little while longer, we're still going to have the design in California made in China kind of you know, philosophy. Uh, but it's, it's starting to change, which is which is good because, you know, in the case of, of the pandemic, we saw how the personal protective equipment, mm-hmm. the PPE was was kind of, they could hold that hostage against us. It's all made in China. And then every country essentially um, during a pandemic enters an isolationist kind of policy, right? Yeah. Yeah. So if we rely on 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 foreign hardware that's critical to national security, whether that's chips, AI, uh, let's say GPUs, um, if they're manufactured in, in China. I know 
that Taiwan, the Taiwan Superconductor, uh, TS, um, what was it, Tai Taiwanese Superconductor Company, mm -hmm. um, they, um, they, they, they are, they have a huge market share for, for the PCBs and all the critical components mm -hmm. that, that are put into cars and then computers and all sorts of different kinds of electronics. So having that all in other countries such as China and Taiwan, Taiwan is on the brink of invasion and China at any point can, can just dictate isolationist policies. We're at huge risk. Um, and we need to be very cognizant of that. Uh, so having some kind of diversification in, in how we source our critical equipment, that would go a long way in preserving our interests. Um, especially um, NATO is starting to heavily rely on, on drone combat and circumventing that kind of, you know, the Iranian drones and, and different kinds of evolving, rapidly evolving types of attacks that we've been seeing on the battlefield. So at any point, you know, with, with, with Russia and China starting to align, um, yeah, I mean, bringing back the manufacturing here would, would be critical. Yeah, I'm, I'm totally agree with you. And uh, I should say that uh, some of my friends, they uh, also from Ukraine, and they started, the hardware startup like 10 years ago, and uh, yeah, the, the story of, of their startup is it also was hardware. So a very, very typical story. So they had a sales uh, office here in the United States, uh, manufacturing in China, and but designed in, in Ukraine. So it, it's a bit different, but very, very similar. Uh, so yeah, it seems like China is still very important for the hardware production and yeah, it's it's I think it's natural, as you know, all this process was was made not in one day, and it was made for years. So, uh, but I believe, you know, if you will look at what Elon Musk is doing, I suppose it's the best way is not just to bring uh, manufacturing back, but all, but also uh, uh, improve it, upgrade it. So like more usage of robotics, more yeah. usage of not human labor, but robotic labor, because it's more technological, it's more sustainable. So that's how you can produce a really high quality products and uh, uh, in mass production as well. Uh, maybe sometimes you don't need so massive production, maybe you just have to, um, to, to create some something uh, in a not 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 a so big scale because especially if it will be prototyping probably robotics is even better because if it will be uh, used for uh, like unique uh, unique uh, uh, prototypes maybe it's even better I, I don't know it's just an idea so but let's yeah I return back to the to the drones and um, you know, now computer vision is very important and it's it using for analyzing the, the objects and uh, how do you think, um, uh, and yeah, that's how it's con connected to artificial intelligence, to knowledge management, how, how do you think this computer vision is reshaping defenses, strategies and offering some unique solutions. So let's discuss it. Yeah, yeah. So computer vision is, is playing a very big role in automation, in in processing aerial footage, aerial imagery. So, with the with the proliferation of DJI drones in in the conflict in in Ukraine, there there's a lot of uh, manual operation of these drones. Yeah. So that means an operator has to be you know within several kilometers of whatever area of interest um, is being either surveyed or, or either targeted. So, and you know, there's, there's inherent risk with, with operators being so close to um, the areas of interest, especially in that conflict. Um, and then also um, in cases of where 
GPS is is compromised or or jammed, GPS denied navigation algorithms can play a huge role in helping helping these small unmanned aerial aircraft land and take off from the right places. And and you know if suddenly there is a jam while an aircraft is is in flight, can it can it use the the perception of its surroundings to still mm-hmm get from point A to point B, essentially. Um, so computer vision has made great strides um, with these kinds of tasks, and also um, with target acquisition, also with, um, and you know, non-militarily, non-militarily um, s- simple tasks such as counting um, cars in a parking lot, counting, you know, bales of hay on a farm, uh, measuring uh, the crop yield, Measuring dead areas where um, you know maybe you added a little too much, there's too many nitrates in the soil, too much phosphorus. Um, you can better allocate your fertil- fertilizers, better allocate your water, um, and you know satellite imagery uh, has multi-spectral capabilities. Um, but you know you have to satellite imagery is the cost of acquiring satellite imagery is decreasing, but it's it's not readily available for everyone uh you'd have to be like a small to medium or i'd say medium to large enterprise to say you know knock on maxar's door and say hey i want to have satellite imagery from yesterday mm-hmm. uh, that's not available for everyone um you know if you're a government agency much easier uh, but let's say you're a small business you're your farmer your who knows like a property manager it's much harder to acquire satellite footage from yesterday or from even a month ago, um, and you know, Google Maps and Google Earth and all the mapping platforms, they update roughly every couple months and, and they don't equally update every sector of the earth. They, mm-hmm. they update areas of high population first and then, and then they eventually get to the rural areas and, yeah. and all of that. So computer vision and drones gives a unique opportunity for, for small, smaller stakeholders to take control of aerial intelligence mm-hmm. right and not having to manually annotate and manually write down things that they see in their footage um, you know there are there are there are companies now that, that can automate these tasks that I was talking about uh, these small practical tasks that are done with a pair of eyes in the sky and then maybe attached to a, an edge device an edge device that can actually process that footage and and maybe equipped with a GPU that can that can run object detection, segmentation, localization, and you know techniques such as that. Um, you know these smaller smaller businesses can can actually have very powerful tools at their disposal, uh, and a lot of these things are open source. You know you can put you can put YOLO the you only you only look once algorithm on on an edge device, and you can count how many cars are in your parking lot and you can see how to better design the next lot if you have another lot that you want to build or you can better analyze uh, what kind of you know what kind of customers like you know what kind of vehicles are entering your lot and then from there you know like you can estimate other things um, yeah. but but yeah I, I think it's exploding in the amount of possibilities and it's a very exciting time yeah, you just remind me of a, a very funny story uh, you guys just told me uh, yesterday. They were in some bar or disco and uh, they said, we never seen such a, a lot of people that's so weird, but in a different way. <laughs> so I mean, it's, sometimes computer vision can be used also for analytics. Who is entering the you know your bar for example and yeah. who is your target audience yeah it's also it's also uh, yeah remind me of this this funny situation so let's go to the next topic drones in defense from surveillance to combat yeah it's a very very hard topic but I think it's nice to discuss at least what's happening and uh, Let's just try to feature startups that are leveraging drones equipped with artificial intelligence and computer vision for military applications. Yeah, you already mentioned DJI, probably they didn't want to 
to make it used for combat, but that's what's happening. But yeah, let's discuss it if you if you yeah. if you want. Yeah. So DJI issued a statement that they didn't intend for their their drones to be used in warfare, but unfortunately, that's just what happens. Technology is is itself amoral, and it's it's used by by people and and people that can have nefarious intentions and you know that's just the state of affairs currently and yeah i mean right now um there is a significant change in, in conventional warfare essentially so if you look back all the way to the revolutionary war in this country we had our revolutionaries the continentals they they changed their style of warfare against the british you know the british they were a very they they essentially marched in matrices, yeah, right? Yeah. You know, with let's say you know a few rows and and many columns, and the rows would, you know, the first row would would duck down for the second row to fire, and then mm -hmm. the first row would come back up while the second row would fire or or would reload rather, and you have this very orderly system of combat. Um, however, when when you factor in guerrilla warfare tactics that some of the continentals learned from the Native Americans, it, the British really, really struggled in certain scenarios because the way that the British fought other empires was a very, it was kind of like a very gentle, gentleman-like uh, affair, right? You know, you have two armies and they would just be these two, like two-dimensional grids that would, mm -hmm. that would fight each other. And then um, when the British faced some of the Americans, once they started getting smarter, um, they were really suffering he heavy casualties, especially when going into forests and, and on, on convoys and stuff like that. So anyway, um, changing, changing the, the way that you fight um, when, when, you, when the circumstances are against you, that's, that's, not, that's not something new. This mm -hmm. has been seen throughout history. And drones are, are a new form of guerrilla warfare, essentially. Uh, yeah, that's true. Uh... Uh, yeah, by the way, Ukrainians also, uh, I mean, Cossacks in the past were also very inventive in, in, in the war, war, warfare. And uh, yeah, as you, as you mentioned, yeah, many of European armies were, were, were very straightforward. This was the time when it was sufficient, probably because it, 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 it were more organized. You know? So if, if we were talking barbarians and, and uh, very organized, military force and of course organized will be better than their you know chaotic one but then it's it's changed a bit and yeah so i'm agreed it's uh, it's completely changing all the conventional warfare so um let's try to showcase to showcase how these drones are enhancing surveillance capabilities and enabling precise target identification and stream streamlining data collection in defense operation. I know for sure that now the Ukrainian army is using uh, very efficient uh, systems. Sometimes it's like cropped one and maybe not so in like, you know, big scale systems, but this is what makes the Ukrainian army more efficient. So yeah, let's try to showcase how these drones are enhancing surveillance. Yeah, yeah. So essentially, you know, you can you can be in a very secure location. You don't necessarily uh, need line of sight of, of the drone, and then you can just send it over at, like an entire entire forest um, or an entire field or or across various you know difficult um, difficult terrain essentially, and then you can. I guess you guys probably already know how this works. You just fly the drone around, uh, you send it back, you take notes on what you saw. And, you know, and this, this kind of knowledge management uh, is, is not the most efficient, but it's, it's effective, right? For, for very localized operations, you know, either something is there or something's not, yeah. right? Uh, but for more complicated tasks, uh, such as analyzing movement of, of troops, uh, you know, various different movements and, and, and uh, paths of convoys and paths of, of military equipment and you know 
if you have a lot more that you're tracking, then this kind of pen and paper annotation doesn't really work as well. Um, and, and DJI uh, does not design their, their software for these kinds of use cases. Um, if, if you take a look at what the use cases are for the, the DJI software, it's, it's you know, simplified um, you know, movement. Let's, you can do um, automatic orbits, you can do, um, you can, you can do uh, path planning, uh, mm -hmm. To a certain extent, for mapping purposes, you know, for the enterprise drones, but you know, for you know, entry level models like the Mavic mm -hmm. or or other entry level models, the point is not reconnaissance. Yeah. The point is to record 4K video to show to your friends, to record, shoot a family video, um, shoot a music video, you know, maybe do a tourist video for your for your hometown. But these drones. The intended use case is being completely flipped on its head, and that's where knowledge management and geospatial intelligence could could really come in in play. However, DJI is not going to create software for this purpose because they uh, they denounce the use of its use for violence. Mm -hmm. um, so this would be something that would need to be built on top of their SDKs or their their APIs. And I'm not sure um, whether you, the Ukrainians are doing that. But they're very, you know, very intelligent um, yeah, yeah. hackers. Essentially, I'm sure they have. Yeah, for now it's just a matter of, of survival. So yeah. that's why, you know, some unfortunately some of my friends now have to to fight. So they have to be very inventive because it's about their life. And this is the point. Yeah, that's I want to discuss next. Uh, so the, the potential ethical consideration and challenges associated with associated with the deployment of autonomous drones in combat scenarios. So for now, these drones are controlled by by people, and of course, if artificial intelligence will be in control, it's where this ethical consideration and challenges appear so yeah it's it's a bit scary because you know it's uh, it's almost like uh, we were watching in this Terminator movie when drones and Terminators were, were fighting against humans and yeah it seems that we are very close to it and drones became the first real tool that's used for this purpose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So one thing that computer vision will struggle with is when when you have to identify targets, how do you know if it's friendly fire? How do you disambiguate between a hostile, a friendly, or a bystander, yeah. essentially? So the, the problem is with, with the development of these kinds of algorithms, and, and, and especially if you're under desperate circumstances, it's very difficult to... to ensure the, the ethics of AI systems in such a, in such a complicated battlefield. Um, however, you know, in, in, in these cases, you know, where, where it's total war, essentially, you know, civilian areas are not untouched, right? Mm -hmm. It's everything's kind of blended together. And that, that's one of the terrible things about the war. Um, so yeah, like the use of AI in, in, in this kind of in this kind of theater, this is technology that should take years to develop, you know, in terms of, if, if we're talking about rolling out target, automatic target recognition on, on DJI, on consumer grade drones, yeah. right? Um, but right now that's not really happening. What's happening, the common attacks are, are just attaching grenades or attaching explosives mm -hmm. and then um, going to tanks, going to like high traffic areas and, and hoping to you know, eliminate the targets, right? And hoping the ta tank hatch is open and, and flying directly in. And these are kamikaze style attacks. Um, but there's, to my knowledge, I haven't really seen um, a high level automation with regards to those kinds of attacks. I've only really seen operators, you know, hidden by an alcove or a safe, safe area and, and piloting the drone you know, manually finding mm -hmm. the targets and yeah, acquiring yeah. it. Uh, but, you know, my only, con my biggest concern is with, with, you know, kind of makeshift computer vision 
algorithms being rolled out on a battlefield on, on drones not necessarily designed for, for combat, you know, th- it could kill anyone. Yeah. Someone yeah. on your team, someone on a bystander, and disambiguating that it, you, it's just very difficult. Yeah, yeah. We still have to be very conscious about how we use it definitely yeah as you know it's scare scaring me the most because when something is just flying around you and, and you can't hide you can run yeah it's it's so 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 yeah dangerous so yeah but as we know not the, the it's just a tool Somebody have to, you know, to push the button to, to pull the trigger. Yeah. And that's why it's mostly telling us about the culture, about the, those who are using these tools. So yeah, I believe that till now all the moral and ethics fundament 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 is very important. Yeah, it, it's very important, and also privacy as well. You know, when you have drones hovering around and, and analyzing your movements, like for, you know, like if we go back to the example earlier that I mentioned of, you know, seeing how many cars are parked in a parking yeah. lot, and and then maybe tracking um, how you enter the store or how you leave, and how much stuff do you have when you leave, you know, versus how much you came with, in with. Um, do you have a child? Um, mm-hmm. You know, do you have a stroller? And then once you have these like kind of drones hovering around, you know, there's already this kind of computer vision uh, layer at, on top of the CCTV stacks mm-hmm. that you see in businesses, right? Mm-hmm. You know, there is a company called you know, Dragon Fruit AI that they would they would like kind of monitor um, computer they, they would monitor uh, like CCTV footage and help business owners skip to areas where there could have been a crime. Mm-hmm. committed and uh, amongst other use cases and uh, cloud cloud-based video analytics right mm-hmm. so there's already kind of automation being done on cctv footage analyzing what people do and and um you know how they react to certain products and, mm-hmm. and you know what like what part of the store were they most excited in you know and and drones are essentially an extension of of like closed circuit television in cer- certain use cases right mm-hmm. it's just that they're not permanent infrastructure installed um, so, you know, but tr- the thing is about drones, uh, they, uh, they can be flown anywhere. They can be flown over backyards. They can be flown, you know, very by close by windows and stuff like that. So, you know, um, there, <laughs> there, there are a lot of privacy concerns. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. I like the idea of using uh, computer vision for analytics. It's what can bring the better to, to businesses. But yeah, the privacy issue is still very important. So they, so it's nice to be sure that this data is not used against people. Yeah. Uh, yeah. If it will used to bring more value to the people, that ethical. If it bring to you know blackmail people later, that's not good. Okay. Thank you, Kyle. It was a very interesting um, journey. So. Let's go to the next topic. It's uh, AI powered knowledge management in defense. Yeah, by the way, uh, not so long time ago, I, I, I was on some um, PhD, uh, PhD uh, presentation mm-hmm. uh, in, in Stanford University, and there was some, some, some yeah, the guy was presenting his work in. Uh, using AI in, in military but in strategic uh, level and uh, yeah it was very interesting for me as you know there was a lot of discussion how these systems uh, artificial intelligence systems could be used in, in different situations different ways but let's try to highlight the importance of the knowledge management in, in defense operation operations and the role of AI in transforming this domain yeah, I see a lot, a lot of, of dramatic shifts. What, what, what can you tell us? Yeah, I, I recently wrote about uh, Scale AI released a large language model tuned for uh, defense strategy and defense decision making. 
and I think I forget who exactly the the customer was within the government, but essentially the military to this day has a lot of a lot of archaic processes, and also still use uh, paperwork in a lot of cases. Um, uh, they have come a long way to digitize paperwork, reports, and stuff like that. Uh, but what Scale AI was doing was essentially ingesting all of all of the reports. You know, for example, like let's say you know officers, they have to manage you know a lot of soldiers below them, and there's a whole hierarchy of of reporting. Essentially, you know, yeah. there's always a, there's always someone to report to, and managing people that entails a lot of paperwork. Um, so you know, what Scale AI is doing is ingesting a lot of the, the documents in, in some of these um, branches of the military and offices and saying, hey, you know, I can provide a concrete, clear picture of, you know, your personnel, uh, what are trends uh, in, in terms of, you know, like, are um, our soldiers failing to report for duty on time? Are, are there... Systemic issues in in terms of the operation of of a particular um, company or battalion or or whatever whatever unit you want to call it, and saying hey like you know we're gonna package we're gonna scrape all of this data and then we're gonna package it in in a large language model such that you can ask it questions mm-hmm. you know say hey like how's how's company A doing versus company B today. Um, Okay, the the large language model will say, okay, um, looking at the attendance or the performance reviews or the reports, you know, company A is doing comp- better than company B for these reasons. Mm-hmm. And having a an interaction like this um, can actually go a long way for for decision making. You know, because officers before they would have like <laughs> file cabinets full of records, mm-hmm. and the, the the issue is, you know, it's, it's, it's the trust, you know. A lot of these things are classified and, and not for um, public yeah, dissemination. No. And, and the way that OpenAI improves its algorithms is is by ingesting all of this and making the model better, right? It's, it's additional training data because they study the interactions between the user and and the output of, of the chatbot, essentially, yeah. right? You know, yeah. does the user react favorably or disfavorably? You know, was that a good response? Judging from how the user proceeded, that was a good response. Mm-hmm. And Samsung engineers actually made a critical mistake by uploading some of their source code to OpenAI's oh. chatbot. And, and then, <laughs> and then uh, I think uh, other engineers in other companies, or, or um, I forget how it was discovered, were, were getting example code generated that from, looked like it was from a different code base, a proprietary code base. So that's why... Um, you know, the scale AIs, I think it was called Donovan or I forget what it was called exactly. But what they're doing, you know, it, it's very serious in, in, the, in the sense that their data ingestion and, and training process um, needs to be very secure. Mm-hmm. And it, it cannot benefit from the same open source network effect that, that the open AI's chatbot is getting. You know, crossing, they were, I think they were the, the fastest app to reach a million users in history um, yeah. and you know open AI can benefit from this scale AI in the case of you know providing a military mm-hmm. LLM cannot benefit from from that as much um, so yeah that, that's just one example there yeah I, I, I really really find it yeah it's probably not funny for Samsung to get this <laughs> situation yeah. but yeah in general yeah, I see it's it's um, AI as a tool is a really great, great technology. But as I said before in, in previous episodes, it's very important. Um, what data do you use for training and, and how do you train it? And who will then use this uh, LLM model? Uh, yeah, so I mean, it's, it's definitely will go in the direction when in every area we will have a, a very specific AI that will be trained specifically for this purpose, because I hope this will bring us this privacy and security. So it seems like um, 
yeah, of course, there will, will be some technology for training and then for for using this this specific AI for this specific uh, uh, problem, you know. So yeah, and of course, it's not a good idea to mix all these uh, uh, things together because it will be it could be very very insecure. Yeah. Okay, so let's showcase some startups that's on developing AI powered platforms uh, to capture and rise and disseminate critical knowledge within defense organization. I know that somehow volunteers involved, but yeah, we are not advertising anybody. Sorry, <laughs> nobody is sponsoring us yet. Um, yeah, probably, um, yeah, I, I know that there are some advanced solutions it's already used and uh, yeah, some of them probably we don't even should know <laughs> yeah but uh, maybe maybe some of them so what 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 can you tell us yeah about this I, i'm not very deep in this area i just heard about volunteer as uh, i read the book uh, uh, of peter till uh, from zero to one it's a great book i should say yeah and volunteer was maybe at first used for for different purpose but now it's also used for defense as well um, yeah so uh, yeah yeah so I think um, a couple companies to know are you know obviously Palantir C3 AI also Anduril Industries so Anduril has been making a lot of uh, investments in, in startups um, as well as Inkytel um, these are kind of the big players in the defense space that are on the cutting edge side um, mm -hmm. versus the, the primes. The, the primes like uh, Lockheed, Northrop, yeah, yeah. they're more focused sure. on, on delivering on those big contracts um, for you know the tanks, the fighter jets, maybe spacecraft, satellites, mm -hmm. stuff like that, and Boeing as well. Uh, and then you have those companies that I mentioned earlier, you know, working on more cutting edge stuff. Uh, not cutting edge, but you know, maybe more software oriented or computer vision oriented. And you know, there there are others, um, but I don't have a huge market research of that area. And Shield mm -hmm. Shield AI, um, that they're they're developing an AI pilot essentially. Mm -hmm. You know, so a fighter jet pilot. Not yeah. not like you know those those UAVs that 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 look like the the silly um, I don't even know how you would describe the, the you know those drones that were flying over the Middle East and, and mm -hmm. kind of um, yeah I forget what I forget what it's called maybe anyway yeah. um, but developing a fighter jet AI significantly different to program a dogfight versus uh, a point A to point B and, and drop drop a payload at yeah. point C, mm -hmm. right? Um, tactical maneuvering and, and firing and, you know, target acquisition, evasive maneuvers, all of that being factored into an AI pilot, that is, that is a significant, uh, much more of a challenge, in my opinion, uh, versus the current, you know, um, UAVs that, that are being used by the military. Because... Mm -hmm. um, you have you have people still operate those um, just remotely in, in some small I forget somewhere in Nevada they yeah. have they have like a little little place where they um, pilot some of these drones um, but yeah that, that's kind of a little sample of the, the landscape right now yeah Nevada is definitely a good place for such for such works yeah as yeah there are lots of space. Uh, you know, I, I think that Ukraine is also will be a very interesting uh, player in this kind of technologies. As now I know a lot of people start working uh, uh, more than that. Uh, not so long time ago, there are a, a new cluster was created like Miltech. So I, I suppose a lot of interesting technologies will be uh, implemented in the result. I'm, I don't know how big will it became, but but it's definitely now the frontier of you know of all events and and these technologies could be you know used in real time and, and all these experiments could be could be uh, you know, imp 
implemented in a very short term. So, um, yeah, let's uh, come to, to yeah to, to the latest to subtopic. So uh, let's explore the benefits uh, of intelligent knowledge management system for enhanced decision making, faster response times, and improved operational efficiency. Yeah, so I believe that you know artificial intelligence, as you said before, is a really good technology that help us, you know, to process a lot of data in a very in a, in a very short time so and I believe this is uh, the biggest advantage of artificial intelligence as you know human can you know can be tired you know we can lose our focus but AI you know it's just work as a machine so it it, it, it shouldn't be uh, tired maybe it could have some hallucination as you know yeah but in general it works very precisely so yeah, how do you think uh, it, it, it can improve all these systems and it, and it can? Like what systems in particular? Uh, I mean all the computer computer vision decision making. You know, uh, so everything that we have discussed before. You know, uh, when yeah, I believe that you know now it's mostly. All the system are cloud-based because you have to process a lot of data yeah. and I believe that somehow it would be later more embedded you know that's how they can become more aut autonomous but for now yeah probably it's just too, too, too complex to discuss right now but yeah I, I believe that some benefits could be you know this smart assistance you know because for now the if we will come back to the topic of ethics it's very important who take decisions and I believe th that is the question I was asking in, in this PhD presentation mm -hmm. and I was asking who will take responsibility for the decision yeah because AI you know still nowadays the, the biggest Concerns about your eyes, it's we still not ready to give responsibility to AI to make decision for us. Mm -hmm. And uh, if we are talking about responsibility, the persons who who make decisions are mostly take responsibility, even if they are using AI. So AI could be a really good assistance, but not decision maker. So, what's your opinion on, on, on it? Yeah, well, if we look at generative AI and, and how how the content rights and the copyright is being kind of evaluated for for the outputs of those of those models, it's it's really a gray it's a gray area, right? So, with with respect to decision making responsibility who made that decision you know and then asking the question who made that piece of art mm -hmm. you know the the training data for you know the corpus of text or the corpus of images um, that something like mid-journey would use to to output yeah. a piece of art is it the person that generated the prompt so nicely or is it all of the artists it's is it a a small weighted sum of, of attribution of all the artists yeah. that contributed that of which their works were sampled um, to create mm -hmm. to generate that piece of art by mid journey you know is it a sum a weighted sum of all of the prior past decisions that were referenced in the model architecture uh, during inference time that share the responsibility, share the weight of the responsibility for the decision uh, that was outputted by the model. You know, was it the model itself? Was it the person that commissioned the model? Um, was it the person that, you know, commissioned the project itself? Like, you know, these are all important questions, right? Um, 
but obviously it would be nonsensical to say, okay, your training data was in my was used by my algorithm, therefore it's mm-hmm. your fault. That's that doesn't make sense, right? Uh, because they didn't consent to that. <laughs> um, but but yeah, you know, it, it's it's tough because if if Midjourney uses like elements of Van Gogh of of Salvador Dali and all these famous people, like, and it doesn't know how to kind of pay attribution towards the inspiration. Mm-hmm. I think I think there should be an explainability, um, less black boxiness to, to the way that these things are generated, such that it can point to the influences, point to the inspirations, mm-hmm. right? Uh, that that should not be an indictment in in cases of things going wrong, but it should be a way of saying why did you make that decision? You know, because a human, if I ask you, you know, like with respect to your startup, like, you know, why did you do this this particular way? You would you would tell me in the past I I you know I ran into this issue, mm-hmm. I, and then that makes me think this way uh, because of what I experienced in the past. You know, algorithms are not really good. Uh, models are not designed for that kind of explainability just yet. Uh, so until until we get to that level of explainability, it's really hard to find culprits mm-hmm. um, other than the people that put that algorithm in service. Yeah, yeah. Right? But, or, you know, who, who curated the data set? You know, I, I'd say um, the, the stakeholders in the machine learning engineering and machine learning ops you know, cycles, you know, you have machine learning engineers that just have to, have to decide what architecture, um, you have to decide how it's operated, right? And then you have to design what data is trained on, mm-hmm. right? You choose the wrong data set for your use case, um, you can have, that can have significant consequences, right? Uh, but also you could have great data, but a terrible model architecture. And then you can have both great data and a great model architecture but the completely young, wrong use case. Mm. And so it's, it's a complicated question. Yeah, but, but you, you uh, already um, remind me some, some thought. Yeah, there was some post not so long time ago in, in some social media. And there was a really good example of, of uh, combining uh, large language models and knowledge graphs that's how we can came to this explainability mm-hmm. and I believe this is the right way to go because uh, now it's not uh, important only get the final result but also understand how this result was made the intermediate yeah so I believe this is uh, the right way to go yeah I will skip one one segment I don't I don't I, we, we just already discussed a lot yeah. and I, I, I would go to the next step let's talk about startups and showcases uh, how do you think innovations uh, will drive the future of defense and uh, let's try to feature some some hard tech startups yeah probably your your startup will be also one of them. Yeah, yeah. I really wish you uh, to to be one of them. And yeah, let's exemplify the convergence of drones, AI, knowledge management, and and computer vision in defense. Maybe not only in defense. So you don't need to be, uh, you know, um, uh, limited on the defense. So because you're you're your startup is not directly connected to the defense, but yeah, it could be used. It started in defense yeah. Yeah. and we're focusing on the commercial use cases yeah. and then we're gonna keep all our government customer discovery and you know those customers, we're gonna say, hey, you know, we're validating this in the commercial markets, but we know this is dual use case tech, which mm-hmm. we, can, we can later bring back to you. So, okay, let's try to feature some, some hard X startups and ex- yeah, may, may just show some examples. In wh- why do you believe your startup will have this great opportunity in the future? Yeah, so if you look at two, two examples, like Skydio and Brink. Mm-hmm. So Skydio, that's kind of the 
American competitor to DJI, mm -hmm. right? And they they required a lot of funding, you know, over two hundred million dollars mm -hmm. in consecutive funding rounds. So that's when when investors see that they're just like, holy crap! I don't know if I want to get into this, like. You know, it's 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 a huge funding risk essentially. You're like, mm -hmm. are we going to be able to, con you know, because because of how capitally intensive starting something like Skydio is, you know, there there's a lot of doubt in the succession, the rapid and timely succession of funding, mm -hmm. right? Because over two hundred million dollars, that is a very very rare case. That is not going to happen to every hard tech startup even if they're doing the right things, potentially. Uh, and then if you look at Brink, uh, you know, another drone comp American drone company, they raised over 80 million in consecutive mm -hmm. funding. So when, you know, investors, you know, they, when they hear about causal twin, they're like, you know, let's, let's, um, let's de-risk the technical, technical execution. You know, maybe can you outsource, um, some part of your technology stack? And, and you know, like I, to me, that, that is a good idea, uh, but that also means less control over, you know, the entire technology stack, right? And you know, we're we're trying to build a vertically integrated solution uh, as much as possible because that that equates to uh, more defensibility, mm -hmm. right? But it also it, it requires more R and D, right? So the reason why I brought up those two companies is because um, they. They, they have unique segments uh, in which they service, right? Skydio is, they have contracts with the military. They have contracts with law enforcement, mm -hmm. police departments, fire, fire, fighter fighting departments. Um, in certain cases, um, they, they do car crash investigation. Mm -hmm. They do um, hostage um, scenarios. They do... Um, People resisting arrests and car chases and, and running around in the woods, they, they kind of, they provide support in those use cases. So, and, and, and Brink as well, but Brink un unveiled the technology that's actually similar to ours, uh, but more so for the use case of indoor hostage situations, indoor standoffs, mm -hmm. right, um, with, with um, criminals or sus suspects or mm -hmm. finding people trapped um, by by like you know hostage taker, so they they service law enforcement and military, and you know I'm just like okay this this, this is great they they found that niche they're serving these people and you know the technology is 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 there um, for all of us, uh, but I, I I just said okay let's let's service architects let's service construction construction managers. And let's make our scanning technology a little bit more high fidelity than what Skydio or Brink could provide. Because what they provide is good enough for these scenarios where you just need to know just enough about your environment to navigate it. Mm -hmm. Right? But in the case of you need more information that architects requ would, would require, like, you know, quarter of an inch or an eighth of an inch accuracy or tolerance on a scan of BIM. Mm -hmm. Right, that that is a little bit more involved, more technical challenges, and that's that's the path that we're going down. You know, we want to literally recreate buildings as if you know, as if you were there in person. Uh, and and essentially, the, the mission of the company is to give people um, the tools to prevent themselves from having to go there themselves, especially in, in dangerous scenarios. Mm -hmm. You know, and. In the case of how we started the company, you know, entering ballast tanks is very claustrophobic. Mm -hmm. The atmosphere can can be um, polluted, mm -hmm. high methane concentration. Mm -hmm. And in the, in the case of construction sites, it's not there. There are areas that are not very passable at times, you know. And preventing foot traffic, in theory, uh, will decrease res risk of occupational hazard, right? Yeah. So. So yeah, you know, uh, we're trying to make ourselves, you know, when people ask us about the funding risk, you know, we're, we're different than Sky Down Break. They're doing the law enforcement. They're doing public safety. They're doing military. Uh, and 
while we're eventually going to do military as well, you know, the military has a lot of room for, for working with the, the private sector, either through SBIRs, um, phase one, um, direct to phase two, um, and then obviously the, the larger, larger contracts as well. Uh, no one can have, claim a complete monopoly on, on military business, mm -hmm. at least um, not with the way that I've seen it operate. Um, yes, you can, you can, the competition can try to shake you down, buy you out, um, but I'm not trying to compete with Skydio or, mm -hmm. or Brink. I, I think what Causal Twin is trying to do is just support a completely different customer base mm -hmm. in a completely different way. So that's, that's kind of how I deflect the criticism, um, or, or not the criticism, the, the concerns that investors may have. Um, so yeah. That. Yeah, it, it seems you you already asked all my next questions uh, because it was exactly about what you were talking about. I mean, this unique, uh, you, you already highlight all the unique uh, products and technologies. So, yeah, maybe the one thing I just want to, to ask you about casual twi twins, right? Um, so, what 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 are you looking for in the, in the next step? So uh, probably yeah, uh, some some people that we will be watching us, they can hear you. Yeah. So maybe you can ask about some you know, partnership or whatever, maybe even fundraising. Uh, yeah, yeah. So we're we're you know we're looking for pre-seed uh, funding and. Eventually, I think um, by the end of this year, we're going to cross over into the seed territory. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's been bootstrapped so far. Uh, we've been operating for a year. Uh, but, you know, we're over the summer, we're going to have the prototype built. Uh, we will have a paying design partner signed. That's the goal. And then, you know, once we de-risk some of the technical execution and also the, the business risk, I think uh, we'll be in a much better place um, for fundraising, but you know, as, as with as for anyone uh, when it comes to this, it's it's not about uh, rushing things, right? Yeah. You want to make sure that that you're onto something. There's enough interest from from businesses in the case of B two B and consumers in the case of B two C uh, before you spend a lot of resources and time, money, effort, and all that. Uh, so. You know, while we we do, you know, we, we, we believe in, in, in the mission and, and the product, it's just we need to get that prototype built. Uh, we need to do some more validation with with you know, some of the customers, and um, and then yeah, I think it'll be a very exciting summer for us. Yeah, I see that uh, you are a really good student of Steve Blank. Yeah, that's exactly what he is also telling. All of their uh, the, the key students, yeah. So I just can you know add that you always can count on, on on my company as we are doing some knowledge management software as well, and I would like and I'm happy to 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 help you and your startup. Also, we have a really great community all around the world, and there are mostly startup founders, business owners, experts, and uh, also some investors, private investors, maybe some representatives. Yeah, so yeah, it's nice to, you know, to, to cooperate if it's reasonable. And yeah, so I will just will make some wrapping up of, of what we already have discussed. So yeah, we've talked about uh, drones and uh, and artificial intelligence. It's uh, good and will revolutionize the defense with knowledge management. So as you uh, could, could hear, all these advanced technologies are evolving dramatically. It is used almost everywhere, and uh, I believe it will be even more complex solution later. So Kyle is doing his startup in in, um, in 
area of property of, tech. Yeah, property prop, prop tech. tech. Yeah. So you see how many interesting things are happening, and uh, it's why we are doing our startup garage show. So at least we can we can talk and discuss the most uh, uh, interesting uh, events and and, and startups and uh, all the technologies. Uh, yeah, remarkable technologies, I should say. That's pioneering the hard tech startups, the software startups. And shaping the future um, of defense or of, uh, civil um, you know, operations, so making them smart and more efficient and more secure than even before. So stay tuned for more exciting innovations and startup stories. Yeah, in our upcoming episodes. And remember, it's the future size in Harash. So. I would like to thank you, Kyle, for this great conversation. Yeah, it was a bit spontaneous, I should say, but it's very exciting. And I, I'm really happy to have you as our first guest in our Startup Garage show. So, Thanks so probably much for we will come back to, to, to our conversation later when you will make some uh, progress yeah. in the startup so we can at least to, to check where what happened and what probably could yeah. happen next. Of course. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so that's it. Okay.